morning, everybody. Hello and welcome. We're so happy that you were able to join us today for this exciting and fun event. We'll be learning which pollinator design has been selected to appear on the Colorado Special Pollinator License Plate, should this bill to create the license plate that's currently under consideration at the legislature be passed and signed by the governor. I'm Joyce Kennedy of People and Pollinators Action Network, and we are the sponsoring nonprofit of this application to create a new pollinator license plate. PPAN for short engages and mobilizes our leaders, communities, and individuals across the state to find ways to protect pollinators, people, and biodiversity. We are hopeful that this bill will be successful and that you will all have an opportunity to proudly display on your vehicle your support for bees and other wildlife that are key to the success of our food systems and our ecosystem health. Donations from the purchase of a license plate would be used to support pollinator conservation and habitat work. And we hope that PPAN will be the recipient of those funds for this important work. I'd also like to wish you an early happy Earth Day and thank you everyone for your active participation in this license plate application. We had over 3,400 people sign a petition which was required to allow us to run a bill to create a license plate. We're thankful to all the organizations and businesses that have endorsed the bill. For those of you that have reached out to your legislator, legislators in support of the bill, people have shared a lot about this process. And of course, those of you that submitted a design to be considered, we're grateful to you. There's been an outpouring of support from around the state for the creation of this pollinator plate. We are also particularly grateful to our legislative champion co-sponsors, Representative Kip, Representative Soper and Senators Jacques Lewis and Senator Simpson for their leadership. Special thanks to First Gentleman Marlon Reese for his support of this process as well. And of course, to our expert license plate design judges. If you'd like to say hello or provide comments, please go ahead and use the chat box. And if you have questions, uh, put those in the Q&A box, and we'll have somebody working behind the scenes to answer your questions if they are able. We have a fun and informative program lined up for you today, and we will introduce our guests as we move through the program. And first up, I am going to be introducing to you Becky Long of Siegel Affairs, and she will be giving us a legislative update, and we hope to have one of our legislative sponsors stop by. Becky, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you, Joyce, and thank you everyone for joining and even more so for supporting this effort both at the legislature and um, elsewhere. As you can probably tell, I'm at the legislature now. They are in the legislative session today, and so our bill sponsors might walk by in the background. That wasn't one of them, but if we have them, I'll pull them in. They're going to try to join, but they're working through some committee hearings and some process on the floor. So um, they did let me know they wanted to be here. They just may not be able to make it work with schedule. Um, we've been really fortunate to have four great legislative sponsors on the license plate bill this year um, that's been introduced, and they've all been working very hard um, to get the license plate passed. The bill has been introduced. Um, we can drop a link to it in the chat here in a moment if you'd like to look at the actual bill language. And it is moving through the legislative process. So we've had two of our legislative hearings. We met with the Energy and Environment Committee who passed the bill. We went to the House Finance Committee that also passed the bill. And we are currently awaiting being heard in the House Appropriations Committee. That's going to happen Friday morning this week. And after that, we'll go to the floor of the House for a full vote. We anticipate that we will get through the Appropriations Committee just fine. There's a very small amount of money attached to this bill that needs to be assigned before we can move forward, um, and then we can, can keep on moving. Um, I will say these, uh, these um, hearings have been some of the most fun. The legislators really get in the spirit. They cannot resist making bee and pollinator puns. 
Um, I'm not going to make them resist because I find it really funny, but hopefully you've been able to listen in and hear their enthusiasm for it. And I think the thing I hear time and time again from our legislative sponsors is how much they love the, the folks who come out and testify in support of this bill. Um, we've had really great folks ranging from Girl Scouts to landscape experts and others come give their testimony on why pollinator habitat is important and how having a license plate will help people show their support for pollinators across the state. We know there's lots more work to be done on pollinator health issues beyond just the license plate, but it's really fun to get to show such um, exciting support uh, in the building. And if you haven't listened to the hearings, I encourage it. We will be on the full floor of the house maybe as soon as Friday morning um, or early next week. So as we know for sure what day we'll be up, we can keep people posted. Listen in, there will be bee puns. I can assure you of that. Probably other pollinator puns. If you have your suggestion for the best pun, send it along. I'm sure someone would like to use it. Um, but we're really excited and we're excited to unveil the license plate today and get to share that concept with the legislators as well. So you all are actually seeing this, this plate today before a number of the legislators, um, which is kind of exciting because we wanted to show all of you who've been working to make sure that we could move this forward, um, the first view at the license plate. So I'll be sharing it with other members of the legislature this week. Um, and and I'm happy to answer questions about the legislative process. Once we finish in the House, we'll then move to the Senate and our Senate sponsors are eager and ready to take this bill on and get it through. We've got a few weeks of session left, so we've got plenty of time to get it done. I know it's starting to feel like sessions wrapping up, but we've got time to get it done and it should go through the second chamber pretty quickly. So I'll pause there, but if people have questions, I'd be happy to help try to answer them. I think Except I don't know where to get Ray's shirt, but I think it's great too. <laughs> having me. So we've got quite a few speakers, so we've got limited time. So I'm going to go through things pretty quickly. Joyce, do you have those slides? Okay. I didn't know I would be sharing them, oh. so just give me one second okay. to grab them. All right. If you want to start, go ahead and start speaking, Ray, and okay. I will look for the slides. All right. So these started uh, evolving from was, I'm going to get real general history, but from 120 million years ago, as plants evolved, the wasps uh, turned into bees to pollinate. So as time went on, um, without the slides, I'm going to talk in general here. This is my little bee room. I've got, I can probably set up a thousand square foot stuff. So You know, this oh, Ray, I think unfortunately um, we're having a little trouble yeah. hearing you. Let's try again. I think we got you now. All right. Can, can you hear me right now? Can you hear me? Uh oh. Yes, All sounding right. good. Yeah. Go for it. So, like this picture here is back in the 1500s, early 1500s. And the churches usually commission the artwork. So we'll talk about artwork. And back then, uh, to do prints was very expensive. It was hand engraved through wood or copper, et cetera. Um, so a lot of these prints, I have over 100 vintage prints in, in the room. Um, and I'm going to skip to a couple things. So some of the 1900s we talked about talk about sports teams i'll talk about sports teams the atlanta braves used to be the boston bees and we've gotten away from that from the 1940s 1950s and we've unfortunately aren't talking about bees as much as we we used to in history and bees throughout the the uh celtics when somebody died their soul became a butterfly or a bee and they went to heaven the egyptians ra was the sun god and we, and they never built a temple to him because he came up every morning there he was so when he cried rain every drop that would flow from his eyes when it hit the ground would turn into a bee the queen bee was the main goddess also and and um so 
So you want me to try? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you, Joyce. So um, let's let's go to the next one. Um, so he, here is just the evolution of bees 120 million years ago. Um, let's go one more. Um, so this is the earliest known bee wasps 100 million years ago. Um, let's go down one more. Let's go down to the next one. Um, so Cave of the Spiders is in Spain, and they were doing artwork back from 5,000 to 15,000 BCI. And so they don't know exactly what BC, you know, what age this is, but this is the earliest artwork that, that we've had in, in, in mankind. All right, so let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next slide here. Can we go down more? There, there we go. So the Egyptians uh, in 3100 BC, they started to do the petroglyphs and the honey was used in mummification, uh, of course, candles. You know, we didn't have electricity until, you know, recently in history, but they used it in medical and uh, giving honey to the gods, etc. It was extremely important to them. And they were some of the first beekeepers. They actually put bees on, on uh, hives on boats and took them up and down the Nile. Uh, the lower Egypt, um, the, the king of lower Egypt was called the bee, bee king. All right, next slide. So the Sumerians also, uh, a lot of people say the Sumerians, Egypt are all the same. So they had their artwork. So this was artwork. The cave of the spiders was artwork. And the, so let's go to the next slide. Um, the Greeks and the Romans, they had their mythology. They worshiped bees, the Greeks. Go ahead and go one more. Next one. So here's like mythology. This is a uh, 1500s painted, but this mythology painting was, was in reference to the Greeks and, and Romans. And here we have Cupid in, in Greek mythology. Cupid is an infant in Roman mythology. He becomes an adolescent and an adult. But he has removed some honeycomb out of the tree and he's showing it to his mom and he's getting stung. And the mom is saying, you know, with, with the sweetness of the honey, the yin yang, you know, you get stung, um, all going together. So lots of artwork. In, in the 1500s, 1600s, everything is relating to bees an awful lot. In the churches, every religion idolizes bees. The, of course, the, the Bible, Christianity has quite a few references. The Quran in Islam, they have a whole chapter called the bee, uh, talking about the bee, the importance of the bee. Uh, Hindus, when a child is born, they put a drop of honey on its tongue and whisper God's name in its ear. Um, every religion does it, but throughout history in, in the churches with all their priceless artwork, etc., if they brought in animal fat or, you know, anything to burn, it created smoke. As we know, honeycomb doesn't smoke. So it, it, it was the perfect thing to burn in the churches. Um, all the Romans required taxes and every subject had to give, I think it was 20 pounds of wax a year, regardless if they were beekeepers. So the, the uh, pure candles was very important. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so here is St. Goldneck and um, it, it's, it's, it's the Catholic church. Uh, men are always the patron saints of beekeeping, but it was the women that are the patron saints. So St. Goldneck started a convent and it still relates to today because if we look at all the Catholic hospitals, the Lutheran hospitals, you know, all these hospitals, they go back to the religious orders of their, of their uh, religion because all the convents had bees. They were the healers. They used the honey to heal people with. There was no antiseptic. So, you know, there was no... Um, antibiotics. So it was the honey that they used. So it was very important church. All right, next slide. What do we have? 
Set That's that. the last one I have in the lineup. Right. All right. So, you know, as, as time went on, and I'm going to skip now to like the 1800s, you know, the we started to print books, et cetera, and, and prints became more accessible, uh, books, et cetera. So, so many of them related to bees because it was so important to health, well-being, lighting, you know, sun goes down, you need light. So, um, so when we get to the I'm going to skip to the uh, to this century, uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, 20. So we named sports teams. We named uh, the Indy 500, the first very race. What car won it? The Wasp. Uh, all the sports teams, um, like I said, the Atlanta Braves were the Boston Bees. Um, and then there's so many references to that uh, in warfare. Um, the Continental Navy, 1775, before we claimed independence, the Continental Navy, the first battleship schooner was the USS Wasp. 1976, the second schooner battleship we had was the USS Hornet. And I, I always put all the Wasps and Hornets together with bees because they're all important, extremely important, except for the Western Yellow Jacket that stings us. So. Uh, we, we, 1945 is when we got penicillin and now we didn't need the honey to be an antibiotic anymore. Um, we got away from that. World War II, we actually doubled the number of hives in the U.S. because if you were patriotic, you got honeybees to give the wax to the military to waterproof tents in gear, but then there was food rations, so there was no sugar. So people used the honey for it. After World War II, the, the amount of the need for honey for bees went way down because 1982, there was a thing called NutraSweet that came out on the market. My generation, we were going to lose a lot of weight. So we started to get more and more away. And in the last 40, 50 years, we, we didn't think of organic, you know, honey, et cetera. We didn't see the need and we just, and we didn't have the, we had antibiotics. So we just got away from it, but now we're starting to realize how incredibly important the honeybee is for, for fruit production, you know, food, et cetera. And that was my main point too, is that we need to get back to that. And, and that's what is so important with this license plate and promoting stuff and, you know, pee pan. I mean, it's, it's so important to get the word out. And of course, people know. And as time goes on, we just need to inform people how they can help. And getting a beehive isn't always the correct way. A lot of it is planting flowers, keeping habitat, no-till, being organic, you know, all this type of stuff. So we need to get back to that stuff and uh, promote it more. And, and I commend PPAN for doing that. Um, so, how much time left? Is that about it? Oh, I can't hear you. What no, I've got, you have just a couple minutes to wrap up, Ray. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, let me just show stuff too. Like right here, if there's not a, but these are all different cards from the 1940s. Uh, this is from Germany. Th these these are um, uh, Valentine's cards, etc. Everything is bees, bees, bees. And I got postcards galore. You know, I've got 150 stuff in there. World War II. Uh, Disney started to do uh, a lot of logos for for the airplanes, etc. Bees, wasps, hornets were extremely common. Um, these are different pins from uh, uh, Soviet Russia, etc. Again, these are city pins. What do they put on them? Bees, 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 bees. Third world countries, they don't have sugar beet, sugar cane as much. So it's easy. Every third house has a beehive. Um, the, you know, in the military, 
You know, these are submarines. A submarine, they're going to sting the enemy. Um, but they, I've got a whole bunch of these here. Um, you can see on this bed in this room, all the different product um, Kellogg, um, bit of honey. Um, of course, all the different Spider-Man, Superman, bees. Um, so, um, but honey made, I mean, there are just all kinds of products that we used to promote honey in their products because that sold, it, it was wholesome, but we've gotten away. Um, so there's the uh, Indy 500. These are, and these are all original prints up on here, um, but th these go back to the 1700s and the USS Wasp, USS Hornet in battle, everything that they talked about um, in Russia, they always referred to Russia as the the big bear and all the bees are attacking. Um, of course, all the mythology, uh, the kings, when kings would go into battle, they were the king bee, the whole thing about kings and queens. But when they went into battle, all the bees would protect them. So Napoleon Bonaparte, when he got coronated, he, his whole robe, his his whole outfit, the carpet, everything was stitched with bees. Um, Pope Urban the Seventh um, down there, he's the bee king. The basilica was twelve hundred years old, so he got to re rebuild the basilica, and bees are everywhere on there. Um, that's so hard, but let me let me take you over here. I'm sorry, I'm moving around. Um, this outfit is from the 1880s and it's the Odd Fellows and the Rebecca's. And it was a society in certain life insurance, but everything with them is bees here on the door. This is their flag, 1880s, bees. Bees were unity. They, they worked together. And like I keep emphasizing how important it was for bees within our society to, to heal and, and do stuff. Um, you know, Kellogg's, bees, you know, every, everything. So, um, so anyways, I, sorry for all the making it going every which way. Um, you gave us a sense of your museum, Ray, and we appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Well, thank you. Now we're, we're going to stick with the art theme. We're going to, going to turn to some of our younger artists. We have Tiffany Boyd with us today. She is a retired elementary teacher from Boulder. And upon her retirement in 2019, Tiffany started Classrooms for Climate Action, C4CA. And the mission of C4CA is twofold, to support teachers to embed climate literacy and climate justice into any part of their existing curriculum. And then they also build student agency and student capacity for local climate action. And this is accomplished by partnering with classroom teachers and volunteers. And we've been pleased to work with Tiffany um, for a couple of years now. She brought children down to the legislature for our pollinator breakfast last year. And I am going to turn it over to you, Tiffany, to describe the project that you all worked on this year. Thanks. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Joyce. And thank you, Ray, for showing us your amazing collection. That was really cool. So we are excited today to be here with three of our second graders. We had 75 second graders from Louisville Elementary School. Um, participate in a very in-depth interdisciplinary unit around protecting Colorado pollinators. So I'm here today with um, C4CA's intern, Lauren Bay. Lauren can wave. And we have Paige with us this morning from Louisville Elementary. Paige, can you wave? 
This is Paige and Evie. Evie, can you wave? Great. And Chloe. All right. So these outstanding seven and eight year olds are going to share with you a little bit more. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, one of the things that we are really focused on is making sure that we embed hope and agency so that students, because climate change and issues like pollinators um, being threatened, these are things that kids hear about all the time. And we're really focused on making sure that students feel empowered with facts and understand that they have a role in helping to solve some of these problems. So one of the main things that we do, thank you Joyce for that great introduction, is we partner with teachers. So we had the great opportunity to partner with Holly Hansberg, Rebecca Lavager, Kristen McCormick at Louisville Elementary with their second grade unit on insects. And we helped transform it into a unit on protecting Colorado pollinators. Um, the kids studied the Blue Orchard Mason Bee, um, the White Line Sphinx Moth, the Pawnee Montane Skipper, the Monarch Butterfly, and I'm forgetting one. Oh, the Western Bumblebee, which are some of our really important Colorado pollinators that are currently being threatened. We really believe that science, literacy, and civic engagement go hand in hand, and that we need to prepare students for the world that they're inheriting with agency and with hope. So let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Paige. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that the kids are very focused on solutions. This is Paige's excellent um, license plate design, encouraging us to protect the white line sphinx moth. And I'm gonna turn it over to Paige. Hi, my name is Paige and I am a second grader at Louisville Elementary School. The white line sphinx moth feeds on flowers at night. It also hovers like a hummingbird. We should not put pesticides and insecticides on flowers and plants because it's killing the sphinx moth. There's an important pollinator. If you find a sphinx moth, caterpillar, trap it and let it go into an open space. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paige. And I think all of you will agree that this is quite a remarkable illustration of the white line sphinx moth. So the kids really had a great time learning about the challenges facing pollinators and the solutions. So here's some solutions that many of us know. Don't use pesticides, insecticides, rotate those crops to keep the soils healthy and plant a variety of plants to attract our pollinators. All right, now I'd like to introduce Evie. Evie designed this wonderful license plate to encourage people to support the Pawnee Montane Skipper, which is a very unique um, pollinator here in Colorado. And I'm gonna turn it over to Evie. Hi, my name is Evie and I am a second grader in Louisville Elementary School. And in, an interesting fact about the Pawnee Montane Skipper is part of a large family of skipper butterflies. It is special because it is native to Colorado. You won't find this butterfly anywhere else. Since there are so few Pawnee Montane Skippers, we need to be sure to do all we can to save them. They are struggling to survive because so many humans are using pesticides. They're, they are struggling to survive because the Pawnee Montane Skipper has lost a good amount of, hab of its habitat from forest fires. Here's how we can help the Pawnee Montane Skipper. We should put out our campfires we should stop using pesticides. We should start planting more gardens so they have more places to pollinate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evie. And again, another stunning representation of artwork where we see this great Pawnee Montane skipper on a flower and a very, very unique um, skipper here in Colorado. And some of the solutions that Evie brought up, we really need to preserve our wild pollinator habitats. Um, 
We have to challenge development that's going to destroy native pollinator habitats. And I know many people on this call are up for that challenge. And again, addressing the larger issues of climate change and insecticides, in addition to habitat loss, are vital to our Colorado pollinators. Now I would like to introduce Chloe. And Chloe also is a fan of the white line sphinx moth. And Chloe's going to share a little bit with you about the challenge of climate change. Hi, my name is Chloe, and I am a second grader at Lewisville Elementary School. An interesting fact about the white line sphinx moth is they have wings that are twice as long as their body, so they are often mistaken for a hummingbird. Climate change is hurting the white line sphinx moth, just like it's hurting the other moths. Their numbers are declining because of climate change. Oh, one thing we can do to stop climate change is to speak up and tell the people in our government to make climate change a priority. Another way we can stop climate change is to weatherize our homes, stop the cold getting in in the winter, and stop the cold getting out in the summer. A third way we can stop climate change is to stop wasting food. Eat the food you buy, even if it's left overs. All right, thank you so much, Chloe. That was amazing. And again, a third beautiful piece of art on Chloe's license plate here with the white line sphinx moth. So our group, Classrooms for Climate Action, is very focused on raising student awareness and student agency around climate change. Um, so they came up with a list. If you do have a beehive, use a cozy cover in the winter to help your hive to overwinter. Some things the second graders came up with that they can do, ride their bike, and they were really insistent on this one. They want to teach everyone that they know about pollinators and about climate change. And something that their families can do and something that all of us can do, they wanted you to know that we should all drive less, fly less, eat less meat, buy less stuff, write letters to oil and gas companies, eat from small local farms, encourage renewable energy, fight for climate justice and work on carbon sequestration. So you can tell these seven and eight-year-olds are very uh, focused on some of these great solutions. And of course, voting for people who fight climate change and work on solutions, which are many of the same um, legislators who are helping sponsor this bill. So again, please protect Colorado pollinators. Thank you so much. And we were wondering if anyone had any questions for the students. I had a question. Great, um, go ahead. The first um, pollinator that was presented, you mentioned, um, I th which one was that? Was that the, the Sphinx? Uh, Paige talked, yeah, both Paige and Chloe talked about the white line Sphinx moth. Yeah, so you said to, um, something about, about it when it was in its caterpillar stage. How can you identify a Sphinx moth in the caterpillar stage, what does it look like? Well, wait, do you want me to say yeah, it? Yeah. Um, um, it kind of looks like it's brownish in a way and it has, it like has some bump, like a little bit of bump and yeah, some too. And sometimes they're like green with like pink or yellow dots on the um, on the back of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I guess anytime you come across a caterpillar, save it, right? <laughs> Get it back into into the grass, into the into the habitat. So yeah, thank you, Paige and Evie, for that. And are there any more questions for the students? Well, let me ask them. the The caterpillar stage of the sphinx moth is also eating what plant in our garden? Do you guys have an idea? We, we They're big and red that we grow in the garden. And it's called the tomato hornworm is the sphinx moth. Mm. And they're big and green and they have a horn on their rear end. So, oh yeah, my little brother tried to pull the end off. Oh yes, yes, that's the sphinx moth. So, and then it, it, it goes into the ground in the pupa stage and that's where you were saying where it's big and brown and they're really big and if you dig the garden sometimes you find find them really big so you just find a nice place to put them back in the ground so they can hatch 
They're very docile. So good presentation, guys. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Ray. You. Thank you so much, Tiffany, Paige, Evie, and Chloe. We really appreciate learning about these pollinators and thank you for sharing your wonderful pollinator plate designs with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Okay, folks, we're building up to more and an, another exciting part of our program. And we are lucky to have with us today, Amy Lewis. And Amy is a PPAN board member. She is vice president of policy and communications at the Wild Foundation. And she was also the chief judge of our license plate design contest. Amy, take it from here, please. Thank you so much, Joyce. I'm so honored to be here. And I'm just so inspired by everybody who's on this call, especially um, the, those from the elementary school. Um, and I, I just want to express my gratitude for all of you and, and welcome you here. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the pre-recorded comments of Colorado's first gentleman, Marlon Reese. Marlon is an accomplished writer and a committed animal welfare champion. He is also a dedicated ally to Colorado's many pollinators. We are honored to have his support for this endeavor and with, poll and with pollinator protection in general in our magnificent state. Without further ado, I give you Marlon Reese. Welcome everyone to the 2021 Colorado Pollinator License Plate Contest Winner Reveal. I'd like to thank the People and Pollinators Action Network, PPAN, supporters of the Colorado Pollinator License Plate Bill, HB 21-1145, and bill sponsors for thinking outside the hive and making this creative endeavor for conservation a reality. As a lifelong animal rights and welfare advocate and a conservationist, I couldn't be more excited to continue building momentum for accessible art that brings awareness to the small creatures that have an outsized impact on our environment and our everyday way of life. The importance of the pollinator is all too easy to overlook, but certainly nothing to swat at. We share our home with over 946 species of bees. That's more uh, in our state than the entire Eastern US combined, 250 species of butterflies and over 1000 species of moths. And each, uh, each year around this time, we welcome nearly a dozen species of migrating hummingbirds to Colorado. Pollinators are a critical link in our food chain. What grows on Colorado farms doesn't arrive on our plates without pollinators doing their part to produce many of the nutrient-rich fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds we eat as part of our everyday diet. Whether it's Palisade peaches or Rock, Rocky Ford uh, melons, bees are, one of the, are the reason behind one of our favorite uh, springtime treats. 75% of the world depends on the help of pollinators, and I'm proud that here in Colorado, with your support, we're doing our part to recognize the cru crucial role of pollinators and promote biodiversity. Without these essential little critters, we lose what's dear to us. All we lose, the healthy and vital wilderness that brings millions of tourists to our state. And more importantly, we unravel the natural system that once upon people depended upon to survive. I want to thank the over 49 talented Coloradans, including five kids who submitted designs this year. All contestants should feel proud of the work they've done. Each design is powerful and thought provoking. And soon one of these works of art will be exhibited on the road for millions of commuters to see. We know that this is ju not just about generating buzz for bees, butterflies, and bats. These designs illustrate the need to protect our entire ecological system. Conserving native plants, restoring wild places, and 
addressing food insecurity in their communities and feeling empowered to protect our environment. Thank you for your partnership as we make Colorado the best place for both pollinators and people to live and work. Be safe and be well, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Marlon Reese, for those comments. We're honored to have your support. And um, it is now my great honor uh, to reveal the winner of the Colorado Pollinator Design Contest um, and um, to share this momentous occasion with all of you. Um, first, though, I want to give a couple of brief comments on why it is we chose to make this a contest. In ancient times, before farms, buildings, and cities even existed, humans chose symbols to express their deepest values and most cherished aspects of their unique identities. From dye-stained hands pressed deliberately against the cold stone of cave walls, to the 30,000 year old cave paintings telling a story without words of the animals and activities that sustained human communities. Man has innately gravitated towards visual symbols and iconography to manifest meaning in a chaotic and uncertain world. Never before have such activities been more important as we strive on a larger scale to address the environmental challenges we face. In my own work, building a global movement to protect half of Earth's land and seas in time to stabilize climate change and halt mass extinction, I have discovered that our very survival depends more upon inculcating a vast respect and appreciation for the wild world that came before us, the wild world that continues to exist without our effort, and the wild things that will come after we are long gone. To accomplish this, few tools are more powerful than common and beloved imagery. And that is why the People and Pollinators Action Network has opened this license plate contest to the Colorado community, because it is this community that has the power to imagine and produce the symbols and images that will carry the most power. Before I announce the winter, winner, I want to acknowledge um, the other talented and committed judges I had the honor of serving on in this panel. Uh, there's Sabina Bailey, um, who works for People and Pollinators, and her energy and enthusiasm for protecting pollinators is a continual source of inspiration for me. There's Adrian Carper, who has um, deep experience with Colorado habitats and native species and whose expertise lent so much to um, this program. Uh, there are the folks from Norris Design, our landscape sponsor, who um, brought so much artistic and design experience um, to, our, to our discussions. Um, and it was, it was really an honor to, to serve. And there's Emily Kincairn, last but not least, who is an incredibly talented visual designer and who was able to lend also a lot of expertise to our discussions. And um, our board member, Maria Ellen. <laughs> and how could I forget Maria? Um, Maria is, I mean, she's everywhere, um, working on all sorts of wildlife and, and, um, and animal welfare issues, and has just been a powerful advocate for the environment and um, was also that same advocate um, in, in this design contest. And one more. Oh, one more. I'm missing one. How did I, how did I miss this? Ryan, Ryan Bartlett, our native bee, um, Colorado native bee expert. Oh, thank Local, you so much. Another Colorado native bee expert. Thank you so much. My apologies. Um, there's, there, there are a lot of fine folks to um, work with on this and I didn't want to exclude anyone. So thank you so much, Sabina, for, for helping me. Um, so now, without further ado, um, I want to um, announce, well, first, okay, a little teaser. First, I wanna say a little bit about the contest. Um, our focus was on native species and it was incredibly important for us to represent a Colorado species on this plate. 
Because of the nature of license plates and how they're viewed, it is also important to have clear, well-defined, iconic imagery. And of course, the image needed to be formatted to fit within our unique canvas, a license plate. The winner we selected is Alan Sewell of Denver, Colorado. A little bit about Alan. He's a 38-year-old Colorado native and nature lover. Hang on just a second here. A 38-year-old Colorado native and na uh, nature lover. And he is a huge fan of plants and animals. And when he heard about this contest through nextdoor.com, he just had to give it a try in his own words. Um, Alan says that our smallest and most necessary friends need all the help that they can get, and the People and Pollinators Action Network is on the right path to making that happen. For more on Alan's artwork and photography, you can view that at behance.net, Alan Sewell. Alan's design features a Hunt's bumblebee, also known as Bombus huntai. My ancestors, the ancient Gales of Wales and Scotland, a branch of the Celts that stretched from the British Isles to what is now Eastern Europe, thought the bumblebee was a symbol of community, brightness, personal power, and the interconnectedness of all things. Given the Colorado West's pioneering attitude, our high value on both individualism and strong, healthy communities, I cannot think of a better symbol for the Protect Our Pollinators license plate. A little bit about the Bombus Huntai. Colorado is smack dab in the middle of the Hunt's bumblebees range, which stretches from Manitoba to Mexico. This species loves prairies and dry desert scrub and even lives on the tops of Mexican volcanoes. The native plants they like best, in case you'd like to attract some to your yard, are rabbit brush, sunflowers, Rocky Mountain penstemons, and clover. The featured flower on Alan's design is also a native flower, Gallardia pulchea, the blanket flower. This flower is sacred to the Kiowa nation, which uses it to adorn their homes, believing it to bring a be a symbol of good luck. So I am pleased that it will be adorning our license plate and hoping, hopefully bringing good luck to Colorado and to our pollinators. I'd also like to mention our honorable mentions um, the first honorable mention is Vicki Sanger of Grand Junction. She presented an excellent design that was clear and iconic um, and very beautiful. And it was, it was hard to judge um, which was the best design among all of these. Um, our next honorable mention is David Janiel of Lakewood. Um, his design is also vibrant and really representative of, of Colorado pollinators. And finally, we have Ron Zhang of Windsor, who presented an incredibly energetic design. Um, and we were just, just pleased as punch to have all of these fantastic designs to choose between um, for our pollinator contest. A quick word about um, the, our current winner, too. Um, we love, he presented his license plate in several different colors. Um, the one that we showed here may not be the color that is selected. We're still working on, um, on which color selection we'll have, um, but the, the bumblebee in the center and um, the blanket flower will definitely um, be featured. So unless there are any other comments from our panelists, so I'd like to actually open up for any comments from our panelists. Um, to see if there's anything else that they would like to add to this. Okay, so if there are no comments from our panelists, I would like to just thank all of you so much for your interest and enthusiasm in protecting pollinators and for being a part of this really important process for Colorado um, and the opportunity to find fun, unique and meaningful ways to defend our native pollinators and our native species. So thank you so much for joining us for the, the People and Pollinator License Plate Contest. And um, we look forward to carrying this forward and uh, hopefully having a new license plate sometime this year um, for all of you to feature on, on your own automobiles. Thank you. 
Thank you all for attending and thank you to all of our presenters today. We appreciate your participation. Uh, Joyce, there's a question about um, whether the runner ups, the runner up graphics will be used as bumper stickers. <laughs> That's a fun idea. Keep those ideas coming. We like that. 